So as I was preparing for, for worship this week, it was brought to my attention that the foot washing that we will soon read about was first performed by Mary. The anointing of Jesus' feet in the Gospel of John um, happens in chapter 12 before the foot washing that happens in chapter 13. In the Gospel of John, the women do not go to the tomb with spices because it has already been done. Uh, Jesus was prepared for burial by one of his best disciples and students, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who sat at his feet, a woman being taught by a rabbi, which was revolutionary at the time. And here she seems to understand uh, what others are not ready or willing to comprehend. Or to comprehend. So our first scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She brought it so she bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each of the gospel writers have their own take on the passion narrative. And we conflate their perspectives into, into one narrative. We, uh, Monday, Thursday, you, you know, we think we know the progression of events. It's Passover. Jesus sits with the disciples in the upper room. G- Judas leaves early. They go out to Gethsemane. The disciples fall asleep. Judas arrives with the soldiers and gives him a kiss. He's arrested, etc., cetera, et cetera. Except, you'll notice from the get-go, what uh, Werner is about to read for us, that it's not the Passover in the Gospel of John. It's not the Last Supper. John will share later how it is the night before Passover begins when Jesus is arrested, because for John, Jesus is the Paschal Lamb, and the Lamb is sacrificed on Passover, so Jesus must die on Passover. But I would like to remind you, uh, for folks who struggle with there being different voices and them not always being in agreement, that the truth of the story is more important than whether all the details agree. Scripture was written by human beings who had profound experiences of God, who write these faith do- documents seeking to point to God, uh, but we need to remember they're written by fallible human beings. Jesus did not come to save perfect people but sinners in need of God's blessing. I'd like to invite Werner forward to read from uh, chapter 13. The uh, first uh, scripture lesson is from uh, John 13, verses 1 to 20. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that the hour had come to depart from the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon, son of, uh, Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now that I, what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. 
And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For the reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heels against me. I tell you this now before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The artwork that uh, I chose for tonight, uh, I chose for a couple reasons. One, Peter begrudgingly having his feet washed and his face obviously it also it's it's laughable that that jesus is is portrayed as having red hair because he was not he was not a redhead Uh, he came from the middle east Uh, but in in smaller in the back one of the other disciples is holding his head like this on the table like what is going on uh, because it was this seemed incredible that their that their master would uh, put a, a towel around himself and uh, wash the feet of the disciples. And I was also reminded this week that the, the stole that I wear, that clergy wear, um, had one of the origins is the idea of uh, Jesus putting the towel around himself and being a servant. It's also, I had always uh, heard of it as uh, wearing the yoke of Christ. The yoke means the teachings of, 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 of the rabbi, uh, my my. Uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, that means my teachings. And so this represents the, the, the yoke of Christ, but it could also represent the towel that Jesus uh, put around himself um, as he washed the disciples' feet. So Jesus taught us that following him meant serving one another, which is countercultural. I was reading this morning uh, Henry Nouwen in his book, Compassion, co-authored with uh, Don McNeil and Doug Morrison, and I've just started, but they point out that our society is based on competition and not compassion. Uh, we only worry about the least of these when it disrupts the status quo. We are called to live differently. John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked to one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. The 
third uh, scripture lesson this evening, we will read in unison from John uh, chapter 13, verses 31 to 38. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. So before the story picks up again in Gethsemane, which we will pick up with tomorrow night, there are these chapters, 14 through 17, that I'm, that I'm, gonna, that I'm gonna go through. It's, it's amazing, the idea of like your final, these are your final words, or these are Jesus' final words, the sermons, the prayers, before he, before he knows he's going to be arrested and crucified. And they are some of scripture's most beloved texts. Uh, in uh, chapter 14, it starts with, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not uh, believe in God, believe also in me. If you have attended one of the memorial services that, that I have led, I very often use this text because the language that Jesus is using for, uh, for his death is about going ahead, I'll be going ahead of you and make a room for you and I will come back and make a room you know, and come and gather you. That is all wedding language. It's celebration language. Um, I, the, because that was part of the tradition of when you got married, after you got engaged, the groom would go back and build a room on his father's house. And then when it was ready, at least a year later, he would come back and get the bride. And then there would be a big, I want to say in Spanish, parranda. There would be a big like parade back to, back to the house. Uh, and the, there would be a wedding. And this is the language that Jesus uses about his death. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let be, them be afraid. I'm going to go ahead of you, and then I'm going to bring you to where I am also. And then he promises the Holy Spirit, I will not leave you orphaned. Uh, and he says, those who love me I will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come in them and make our home with them. This whole language of making our home with God and with Jesus. This, this is what he's saying. This is all about, all of this is for us to live in relationship together, to be family to one another. For the gospel writer John, salvation is relationship with God. To be, to live in the light, to be in the light is to be in relationship with, the, with God. To be in the darkness is when we are not in relationship with God. And again, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. All of these comforting, comforting words. And then he changes metaphors in chapter 15 about being the vine and the branches and clinging and he used the the word abide in me again to abide to be at home together um, and then he finishes you know, I have said these things to you so that my joy Maybe in you. He's predicting his death. He's, uh, he's, you know, all of these horrible things are going to happen. But I'm saying all these things to you so that my joy might be in you. And then he goes on to say uh, that it's not all going to be easy. He talks about if they persecute me, they will persecute you. 
and the Gospel of John is written to a people who are persecuted, who have been kicked out of the synagogues to their dismay because they didn't think they were doing anything that was apart from the Jewish tradition, that, uh, that following Jesus was akin to their faith, and it's devastating to them, and he's in this Gospel predicting that for him. They will, kick, they will put you out of the synagogues, um, indeed, an hour is coming when those who kill you would think that by doing so, they are offering worship by God. They will do it in the name of God. They will think that they are giving glory to God by doing it. And may we all be protected from taking that path and that route when we are so sure that we have, that that we, what we do is in God's name and with God's blessing and all the times throughout history when we have been completely wrong. He says in chapter 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Uh, for folk, I, I have found those words liberating for the ways that the spirit has convicted us over the years. Um, to be open to things that this, that Jesus says, I haven't told you everything. There's more to come, but I am sending the Spirit. And that is an encouragement for us to always be open to God's Spirit and how God might be leading us. Um, he then goes into, your sorrow will be turned into joy and uh, wishes them peace. They, they're like, can you speak plainly, please? We do not get what you're saying. And uh, and then he says it plainly, and they say, "Okay, now we get it." You know, but <laughs> but uh, you know, there's still reticence in believing it. And and Jesus says to him, "Do you now believe? The hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have said this to you." so that you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. So before his crucifixion, his discourse, I don't know if you've heard the words peace, joy. I look for the word hope because I always think the gifts of the faith are peace, joy, hope, and love. It doesn't mention the word hope, but peace, joy, and love are throughout this. And then Jesus has a long prayer for the disciples. And he talks about eternal life. We, we quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that the only Son was given, that whoever believed in, believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is defined here. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is eternal life. Again, the words joy, uh, are lifted up and Jesus prays on behalf of the disciples I ask not only on behalf of these but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word that's you and me that's everybody who's reading this has heard of the generations the witnesses and continue to witness to to Jesus Christ and then he finishes righteous father the world does not know you but I know you and these know you, know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. When anybody asks you, what is Jesus Christ about? It is about the love of God made known in Jesus Christ that Jesus and God desired that we live in that love and in that relationship forever and ever. Amen. Then we will get tomorrow. We will pick up with the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. But if you didn't have a chance, uh, I sent this out to the folks who are receiving the daily devotion that, you know, if you have a chance to read chapters 14 to 17 today to go ahead and do it. But um, I summarized, but it's worth sitting down and just letting it soak in that all of this is out of love. And when we are living in relationship with God and in love, 
then Jesus, we are making God proud. The Last Supper, as I said before, is not part of the Gospel of John, but it is Monday, Thursday, and we are going to celebrate the Last Supper. First uh... Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <laughs> 